Welcome to the Touching Into Presence podcast. This podcast is for people who are interested in body work, empowerment, and somatic based practices. I am Nikki Olson. I'm Andrew Rosenstock. We are certified Rolfers. Collectively, we're trained in various movement and bodywork therapies with an emphasis on somatic awareness and client resilience. Through conversations, our goal is to share and explore mind-body paradigms to offer empowerment possibilities. It was a pleasure to be in conversation with Jeffrey Birch today. A certified advanced rolfer, Jeffrey has extensively studied and integrated into his hands-on therapies both cranial manipulation and visceral manipulation. He has developed groundbreaking new joint mobilization methods. Jeffrey received a BA in biology from the University of Oregon in 1975, after which he trained at the Dr. Ida Rolf Institute in Boulder, Colorado, receiving his certification as a rolfer in 1977. He first practiced rolfing structural integration in London and later in Seattle and Honolulu before returning to his native Eugene, Oregon in 1989. By the time he was in London, there were only a half dozen rolfers in Europe. He accepted invitations to rolf groups of people in Oslo, Stockholm, Trondheim, and Tehran. He now lives in Eugene, Oregon, offers continuing education classes. Jeffrey Birch received his rolfing advanced certification in 1990, after which he again began studying at the University of Oregon, where he received a second BA in psychology in 1993 and a master's of science in counseling in 1995. In today's conversation, we spoke about working within a COVID era, Jeff's history within the work, being one of the first rolfers in Europe, working multiculturally, the history of osteopathy, rolfing without deep pressure, and some of the different classes and approaches he teaches. Jeffrey has a bunch of upcoming webinars that should not be missed. Find out more about them from his website, jeffreybirch.com. I was calling in from Dubai, and my internet connection was not great, which brought some static spots as well as me dropping in and out. There also was some external sounds that would come in from some of the other callers' mics, and we apologize for any sound issues from this. So with that, let's begin our talk. Hi, Jeffrey. Hello. It's been interesting to see or kind of hear of people where how COVID kind of just sent some body workers into early retirement. Yeah, understandable. And I think it brought in a lot of fear of what touch is going to look like after all this. But yeah, I think... What will our new world look like? Mm-hmm. My phone goes through periods where it rings off the hook of people wanting to get work. And it's kind of frustrating because I haven't chosen to not go into that space quite yet, only with very selected people. And um, so for sure, there's people who are nervous about getting close. And then there's other people who are like, I need to, I need this work. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll wear the mask and take the rest. I regularly get uh, calls and emails from people who are casting work and I just know. Uh, mm -hmm. I've actually been uh, working since October for uh, my county here as, uh, on their COVID response. Uh, That's right. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's a way I can contribute and uh, uh, help squash this bug mm -hmm. uh, while we're waiting it out, but also gives me an opportunity to uh, more ways to to keep up on the on the current science and uh, CDC directions and so forth. And mm -hmm. no, for me, it's uh, you know not not time. I'm still basically uh, in the shelter in place mode. Yeah. yeah. Do we dare talk about the vaccine? Are you? Sure. Yeah. Do you find it I, safe? Seems good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting way to, to approach it there. Do we dare talk about vaccines? Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take it. I mean, I definitely see this is the thing, though. It's like, to me, it feels new. Like, oh, this is back COVID vaccine. But then when I dive into a little bit and I haven't gone totally crazy about it, but I, again, I've reached out to some of my friends who are 
medical professionals and they're like, the COVID vaccine has been, been in the works for a long time. It's not like in the last year they whipped this up. Yeah, they, you know, changed gears with it a little bit to work with this particular COVID uh, virus, but COVID related vaccines have been coming for a while. There mm -hmm. being a, many COVID uh, viruses in the world, including four different kinds of common cold, including the two most common varieties of common cold. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are crazy things like there's a COVID virus that causes hepatitis in mice. Uh, <laughs> lots of them that, that affect animals and creatures. Well, hence why we got it. Do you believe it came from the, the bat? A bat? Kind of looks like that. Uh, you know, it looks most like <clears throat> one that exists with bats, but it, it also has a lot of stuff that looks like one with a, a pangolin. Um, there's an interesting thing that can happen is you can get a co-infection with two co-coronaviruses uh, at the same time. And uh, there's a less common but not really rare thing where the uh, little transcriber will be running along the, the uh, chromosome uh, copying it and it'll fall off and then it'll uh, latch on to the other one. And so you end up with a copy that's a, a hybrid of the two. So it, it kind of looks like that's what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that you ended up with a, a gamish of a variety that was common in a bat and one that was common in a pangolin. What's a pangolin? Uh, it's an interesting little creature, um, sort of like an armadillo. Okay. Yeah. It's one of the, the sort of mythical Chinese creatures as well. And it's apparently uh, it's one of their delicacies that they shouldn't eat, but they do. <laughs> mm. uh -huh. So I'm, I'm very excited to have you on, Jeff, because um, A, you're awesome. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed a lot of the, the talks you've done. I just took that Hello Work class you did, which I think I have to watch a few more times. Uh, well, was, that, was that the one introducing the, uh, the joint mobilization? Yeah, that one. Yeah. I see you as just a great pool of wealth of knowledge for for rolfers, but but more than just rolfers for, for for body workers for yeah, I've really enjoyed getting to listen to you and getting to speak to you more. And actually I thought it was really we had this really fun experience. I don't know if I shared this with you, Nikki, and I guess people listening, if we if I decide to not cut this before we before we start, where I was trying to share an article you wrote with a group of Chinese body workers. And I was trying to, uh, so I was trying to get it uh, translated to Chinese. And then I, in this group, uh, in a completely different group, I mean, I saw somebody post the, uh, the, the same article and it was like, what? This is, it was so bizarre that sort of different worlds were colliding. And then I found out that it was your daughter. <laughs> uh, it was really fun. She, uh, yeah, she had been in Beijing for a couple of years, and uh, she's now in uh, Weimar, Germany. Yeah. Well, I appreciated your story when you were opening up for the webinar that you were just released about the joint mobilization, how, how your, your first interest was looking at your mother and being curious of what was in her brain and just like the, just the curiosity of anatomy. And that reminded me of my, I think, kind of the budding interest of my work um, is my dad was a businessman for spinal hardware, uh -huh. mostly in scoliosis and things like that. So he founded a company and was partnered up with two doctors. And so basically the doctors invented the hardware and um, recorded the surgeries when they would use it and he would watch this, the videos to, you know, better learn and to be able to properly sell the product. And my dad worked a ton. And so as a young kid, often how I bonded with him was in his home office, watching these surgery videos with him. <laughs> so That's I, a good story. Yeah. yeah, well, and the funny thing is, is, so I could handle it on video. And so all my, of course, I was like, well, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor. And then I, you know, later in high school, the high school I went to had a really big volunteer program. So I'd volunteer at the hospital and I would faint 
when I would ever see like an endoscopy that somehow I was always seeing those and I like fainted three times and they're like, I'm sorry, you, you're great to have around. You ask a lot of questions. We wish you well, but you're a liability. <laughs> you, you can't volunteer with us anymore. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, then I just kind of putzed around and didn't know what I was going to do. But then later I have a brother who became quadriplegic and through his injury, I learned about occupational therapy and that kind of collided when I was getting Rolf for the first time to treat scolio I have scoliosis. So those two worlds kind of, um, you know, I was kind of also close to finishing college and I just had like a general BA degree. Um, Cause you know, with fainting, I was like, well, I, that's not, I can't go into the metal field. I can't handle it, I guess. So then, um, yeah, through my brother's injury, then I learned about this whole other alternative uh, therapy that was out there. And I think that's kind of how I fell into, into rolfing. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah uh, but hearing your story juggled like my little memory tokens. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, that was definitely influenced by my upbringing as well. <laughs> Cause we also too had, you said how they would gift you um, little models, anatomical models and things like that. And we had that around. I mean, we scared the neighborhood out of their pants at Halloween. Cause my dad, we had one of the, you know, the learning skeletons just sitting in our, in our TV room. And yeah. he'd put the candy in the skeleton hand and be like, Ooh, happy Halloween. And then stick it out the door. <laughs> I'm going to turn the camera around for a second. This is, uh, you see George over here. He's been, okay. he's been hanging around here for about 25 years. And, uh, uh, he's occasion. You know, I'm thinking about it because he gets to come up into the the living room on on Halloween. Yeah, uh, right. He's also taken a few road trips with me for teaching in other locations. For example, up in uh, Seattle. So he was seat belted into the uh, passenger seat of the car. Uh, Absolutely. Entertainment of other motorists and service station attendants and so. And forth. of course, you rode in the the, the um, carpool lane, right? <laughs> well, well, also, I, I think the people can't. You know, obviously, we just say so you no, know, Jeff. We release uh, just the audio, not the the video. But some people definitely won't see. But there's also, I noticed when you moved your head, there's three skulls behind you. There's a there's a sacrum. There looks like just bones everywhere. Bones everywhere. Bones and bones and bones. Uh, here we have a cervical vertebra from a uh, black bear that I found out on the forest floor uh, in the coast range uh, out from here. Wow. And uh, yes, uh, uh, skulls, uh, you know, th this, this, is, uh, this is Yorick over here, and this is Garish, and this is Phineas in the middle. Uh, he's a model of the Steinheim man who is uh, 800,000 years old, found in a, a limestone quarry at uh, Steinheim, uh, Germany. Oh, poor Yurik. Yeah, poor Yurik over there. I knew him well. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you were talking about those childhood experiences. Have a friend here in town, Marjorie Willicott, who's a emeritus uh, neuroscience professor at the university. And one of our little shared pieces of history was uh, uh, dissecting roadkill as kids. That had to have been quite gruesome. <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, Jeff, there's so much to talk about with you. Uh, and, and maybe that might just be a nice way to kind of start it. Is, is that, was that your like one of the main introductions that got you more into anatomy was dissecting roadkill or what, what sort of that was one, one piece of it. Uh, I was also just interested in, in body structure. Uh, my, you know, I spent significant time at my uh, granddad's farm and he raised chickens and ducks among other things. And we would get uh, critters from, from him. And so I would, uh, first observe and then soon participate in uh, the butchering of the animals, which of course involved taking eternal organs out or anything else. And uh, I, I, uh, there were, were also 
you know, hunting with uh, deer and rabbits and wild ducks and geese and so forth. And I, I soon developed a reputation as a, a nuisance in the uh, butchering process because I would get lost in the anatomy of it and bog down the, uh, the, the farm process uh, there. So where did that take you next after the farm animals? Yeah, so um, it was my interest in uh, science, particularly life sciences. Uh, the summer before I start, you know, officially started high school, uh, I spent the summer uh, in an intensive year of high school biology compressed into a summer session uh, kind of thing, which then set me up so that uh, my first actual year in, in high school, I took uh, chemistry, which was a prerequisite for then taking the advanced placement biology class, which is, you know, uh, essentially one of the college courses that uh, high school students can, can take, uh, followed by the AP uh, physics uh, course. So moving right along with that. I didn't you know, life doesn't uh, always follow a linear sort of path, so I didn't immediately dive into that. I did other kinds of things, and uh, uh, my undergraduate career spanned uh, four universities, seven years, more majors, and uh, eventually in two countries, and uh, eventually uh, with 50% more credits than I needed, graduated with a degree in biology, which I got more focused on uh, toward the, the end of it. But there were just so many interesting things to, to learn. I would love to keep, keep on staying focused on the line of work, but I have to ask what were, if they were little road trips or what were the, what's the stuff in between that you're dabbling with? Well, uh, languages for for one thing. I had uh, lived from age 12 to 14 in Munich, so I had begun to learn German there and continued that. And then had later was learning Italian and had a year at an Italian uh, university where there was a lot of focus on um, history and social science uh, topics. Hey, so that makes sense while well, you're a well-known international teacher. <laughs> yeah, and actually after I trained as a rolfer, uh, completing that in 1977, I first practiced in, in London. Uh, at that time, their, their rolfing was something new in the world. The new international directory that came out after I trained, this is of course a little print pamphlet at this time, had 173 rolfers uh, in it. And there were six in Europe and uh, began communicating with, uh, with people. Uh, this was of course pre-internet, so this was uh, involved postage stamps and uh, discovered that there had been a rolfer in London, the only one in the UK, but she had moved back to the the U.S. and basically walked away from a, a, a practice there. So uh, I went from training to a very full practice, being the the only rolfer in the U.K. at the at the time uh, there. But I was a little naive about uh, visa kinds of things as I entered, and so. Uh, hadn't really lined up my ducks and was required to leave the country every three months. And I could have just uh, gone to France for the weekend, but I got out the postage stamps again and my uh, membership list for the Association for Humanistic Psychology. And I found groups of people in other places who wanted rolfing. So I would go someplace for six weeks and take people through a series and then come back to England for three months. So I was the first rolfer to work in uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, and uh, Iran. I was uh, in Iran in the summer of 78. I ended up cutting that trip a little bit short. Uh, that was the last summer that the Shah was, was there and things were, were getting a little too exciting. But that had been such a wild experience being, because correct me if I'm wrong, you're still fairly new at rolfing. And Very yet you had all this opportunity to work on 
so many bodies, but then also these bodies that had these very different cultures imprinted or brought into them. That was that was fascinating to to see uh, you know, what you know, some cultural patterns uh, like that. Um, and you know, this is hardly an, an organized study; just clinical observations from from working in in all of these these places. Um, one of the things that I saw in Norway that I didn't initially understand was a lot of very fit, stiff feet. Uh, and later, practicing in uh, several cities in Alaska, I got it. It was about boots in the winter, the, the stiffness uh, suggestion to the feet. Um, whereas in the, in the UK, there were a lot of feet that were not so much necessarily stiff as just kind of wildly distorted. Uh, and I never did really identify what that was, what that was about. Uh, but there it was persistently. I also had several, uh, you know, again, this is 1977. So here we are, or 1978 to begin with. So here we are. Uh, 23 years after the end of World War II. So there were a number of young to middle uh, adults who ended up in uh, teeth chattering experiences on my table, uh, recalling having been children during the bombing of London uh, during that time. I mean, every night for a year and a half, the city was, was bombed and uh, that was quite the trauma for them. Um, I mentioned working in, in Tehran, and that got started. Uh, one of the features of London is it's a very international city. There are people from all over the world there, including at that time, there were a significant number of Iranians there. And uh, some some of them came to me for, for work. Um, and a couple of them expressed a really interesting thing. They would come in and they had rather stiff, full chests. And they said, would you give me some help with this? Because what this fullness in the chest means in Iran is there's a big heart in here. But here in the UK, it's interpreted as pride. So could you free that up for me so I have more choice about what I'm expressing depending on I'm who I'm with uh, at the moment? Oh, I love that story. Yeah, that's amazing. That's beautiful. I also, I want to share, Nikki, I hadn't even really thought about this and it's uh, great because Jeff, as you know, I, I travel a lot and for me, I'm always working with different cultures. So I, I fell into working with different cultures and I didn't really pay so much attention to it at first. And in the last few years, I really have. It's been, it's been fascinating how even, say, in, like England to Norway, which are relatively close and, and culturally somewhat similar, um, especially the north of, of uh, England, which has more Viking history there. But yet the, you know, the adaptation of people over time, psycho, uh, psychobiologically to shift, uh, is is fascinating when I'm you know I'm in Dubai right now almost every day I see people from a different part you know different part of the world and so the way I have to approach them even just by just by talk but physically is is entirely different and it's something that I've just become accustomed to like I, I don't think about it anymore it's like okay this is a Russian person we know culturally this may happen um but I think probably much of our peers stay in one place more or less and um, and don't have to think about that. It's just really kind of interesting. You can tell by my um, my thought process. It's still pretty early here for me. <laughs> wow! And and yes, you know, of course, there are the uh, that is it is interesting to see those cultural patterns and similarities between people in a in a place. Uh, and of course, there are all the individual differences that we encounter and need to adapt to in our, our practices. All right, um, well, how, do, how do we make this work uh, between this client and, and me? 
so it's kind of like there are many cultures uh, wherever we we go, but then the bigger pictures of uh, in, in physical pl physical places. <laughs> I mentioned that for the last you know since October, I've been working for my county here in Oregon, Lane County, uh, Oregon as a what's called a COVID-19 case investigator, which means I'm the guy who gets to call up people who have COVID and uh, uh, see how they're doing and talk them through uh, how to have the most successful and comfortable pro uh, possible isolation period and what kind of resources we can provide them with to do that, draw them out on where they might have gotten it so we can connect the dots epidemiologically and uh, gather names of people that they might have exposed before that they realized that they had a problem that I can pass on to the uh, uh, contact tracer team who will call them up and have a, a related conversation. So I get all of these little windows into so many different people's lives. Uh, of course, as body workers, we do. People come in and they tell us our stories, but they're here for another kind of thing. It's been fascinating, sometimes heartbreaking to, to get all these windows into, into people's lives. And so again, there's going to be so many avenues to go on, but I guess to go back a bit, what brought you to rolfing and was osteopathy before rolfing or was after? <clears throat> osteopathy was after I had, I heard of uh, rolfing first. Uh, my, my introduction to that was I was, visiting a small college in uh, Prescott, Arizona, Prescott College, which at that time was a couple hundred students, uh, 17 miles out of town in the, in the desert. Uh, interesting little place out there. And a uh, friend said, hey, you ought to come along to the commons to the, the talk on uh, rolfing tonight. And I was like, rolfing? Uh, this is, sounds like, you know, something that dogs do when the moon is full or, uh, you know, maybe when you've had too much to drink. And he said, oh, no, it's this weird thing where they tear the muscles off your bones. Excellent. Sadomasochism in the desert, you know. But it was the only thing happening that night. So I went along and the, um, the guy presenting on it was Don Hanlon Johnson, who would later found the... Uh, uh, Institute for Integral Studies in, in San Francisco, and he was a newly minted rolfer at the time. And as I understand it, his previous career had been as a Jesuit priest, so he had uh, uh, very good public speaking uh, skills and made an interesting presentation about it. So I kind of tucked that away in the back of my mind. This was intriguing, but also one of the odder things that I'd ever heard of. And a couple of years later, uh, I had a bicycle crash. Uh, the front forks on my very light racing bicycle uh, collapsed and pitched me over the handlebars onto the uh, pavement, uh, which uh, ended up my spending a few days in a, in a hospital uh, w with that. Uh, and um, <clears throat> there was injury to my knee and to, to back. Uh, that moment, uh, as it turns out, was the end of my rowing career with the crew team at the, at the university and the beginning of my rolfing career. Um, got out of the hospital, was doing okay. Then my back seized up some more. Went to the student health clinic. Uh, they gave me muscle relaxant Flexeril, which by golly, it, uh, it relaxed the muscles in my back, but it also relaxed my mind. Attempting to attend a biochemistry lecture on Flexeril just was not a successful experience at all. And uh, we were approaching the end of a term at school, and I tried to tried decided to give one of these weird rolfers a chance and see what they could do with the, the situation. And at that time, the nearest rolfer was 500 miles away, so I arranged to go to San Francisco and spend six weeks. And three sessions later, uh, I back pain was gone and my body worked better than it uh, had in some ways uh, before that. So I was pretty enthusiastic about that. Who was so, your first rolfer? Uh, his name was Larry Swan. Uh, he didn't practice for very long. As I understand it, he moved into the restaurant business after that. So I came back and finished up my uh, degree in biology at the University of uh, Oregon. 
At that time, the uh, prerequisites at the Rolf Institute were uh, substantially greater than they are now. So after getting the degree, I actually had to go back and take a kinesiology course. Um, and I think there was one other thing I had to do to present the transcripts uh, for that. And then it was off to, to Boulder for the, uh, the Rolfing training. That being the only place, the only structural integration school in the world at that time. And about what year was that that you went in? Did I begin my Rolfing training? Yeah. 1977. And I'm guessing because Ida died a few years later, you would not have studied directly with her. She was still uh, living at the time that I uh, trained. Um, I did not uh, meet her. In hindsight, there's something I wish that I had done. I uh, did my uh, last unit of the training uh, in the summer of 1977 with uh, Peter Melchior uh, as the instructor. Um, I could have waited for a class in September also to be held in Boulder, where there was a basic training and an advanced training held back to back. And the basic students would actually actually attended morning lectures by uh, Ida with the advanced students. And in hindsight, um, I wish that I had had done it, had that experience of, of meeting her. Well, you, you turned out all right, even without meeting her. So, and so you did your, you finished your, your beginning then, and when did you? Oh, he, he, did you hear his question? He dropped out. Sorry, sorry, Jeff, my, my internet's not great where I am. I apologize. I was saying uh, you finished your beginning training and then when did you do your advanced <clears throat> so I, I did the uh, basic rolfing training in 1977 and the advanced training in 1990 and that was with uh, uh, jan sultan assisted by pedro prado and michael murphy in in boulder so wow, you had such a, a a wide variety of teachers yes um you know, the structure of the Rolfing training then was uh, different than it is now. Now we have the unit one, two, and, and three. Uh, there was nothing resembling unit one back then. Uh, you had to demonstrate a knowledge of anatomy and physiology with a mix of transcripts and uh, performance on a, a, some written essays uh, before uh, you uh, entered. And then uh, you were in a, a classroom uh, in a role that was called auditor, uh, where you listened to lectures, participated in discussions, watched uh, demonstrations by teachers, and watched the more advanced students uh, doing uh, work under or supervision. And then later, you'd come back and take essentially the same class again, but with a different teacher, and now you were one of the student practitioners and there was a new batch of, of auditors uh, in it. So the, the, my auditing class was taught by Michael Salveson, assisted by Nico, um, <clears throat> Neil Powers, who the two of them shared an office in San Francisco, uh, also with Dub Lee, the three of them. And the class was actually held in their their offices at uh, 1776 Union Street in, in San Francisco. And then uh, the when I was a student practitioner, again, I was in Boulder with Peter Melchior, assisted by uh, Carolyn Widmer. So, yeah, nice selection of teachers. And you'll recognize you know, those, so a lot of those names, uh, some of them, Peter Melchior and... Uh, Neil Powers, who then uh, became some of the principals in the, the Guild for Structural Integration after that little schism happened. Uh, and actually, at the time that I trained as a Rolfer, uh, Joseph Heller was president of the Rolf Institute. Yeah, with the, with the way, um, just the various teachers that you were mentioning it. Throughout our podcast, we definitely have talked about the history and, you know, the split has come up. And as you're saying this, I'm, I was kind of holding the curiosity of like, where were you in the training before the split? Uh, the, the split ha happened quite a few years after my training. Um, 
The split, uh, the, the, well, Joseph Heller departed a couple of years after my training. The, the situation, as I understand it there, was he asked to be trained as a teacher of rolfing. And at that time, there were only four teachers, uh, Peter Melchior, Emmett Hutchins, Jan Sultan, and Michael Salveson. And they said, nope, not going to train any more teachers for the foreseeable future. And so Joseph Heller uh, said, oh, okay. And so he resigned from the Rolf Institute and set up his own school. Um, and <clears throat> that departure um, happened relatively cleanly. Uh, later, uh, when Peter Melchior and Emmett Hutchins uh, departed to form the, the guild, there was a lot, of, lot more acrimony around the whole thing and remained a hotter issue for uh, a long uh, time. Uh, I wasn't close to the process, so I don't know exactly what happened there. But um, now I ended up with teachers and friends in both schools. And although I've continued my membership with the, the Rolf Institute, uh, you know, remain, maintain affiliation with uh, these, these other uh, places also. You're like Switzerland. It's great. <laughs> Embodying the principle so, of adaptability. Yeah. So then, so that thank you for the the sharing of the start for you with your uh, journey with Rolfing. And then now, I would love for us to dive into where did you, you know you you started your practice from very worldly uh, clientele, and then how did you find yourself in more of the osteopath? Type work. My first introduction to osteopathy came uh, while I was in London. I actually had clients there who were um, osteopaths or osteopathic uh, students. So they began to introduce me to osteopathic uh, ideas and, and uh, demonstrating some, some things. Um, also, you may know that uh, Ida Rolf began really began doing her work in 1944 after she took a workshop with osteopath Amy Cochran in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, she had studied with other osteopaths before that, including Kenneth uh, Little, famous osteopath. But it was after the workshop with Cochran that she really started doing it in 1944. Um, that information uh, came from some extended time that I spent with her, her son, Richard Demerley, who told me more about the, the history of uh, development of the things. And within five years, she began teaching her work, and that initially happened in the UK. Uh, she was teaching at the European School of Osteopathy at uh, Maidstone uh, down in uh, Kent. Uh, but after just a very few years of teaching just in summers uh, there, she shifted to going up to London and teaching through the Gurdjieff Association there. So while in, in the UK, I also encountered a couple of uh, her early uh, trainees from way back, way back then. But to continue with, about with, with osteopathy, um, it really didn't, that didn't really get going for me uh, until uh, about 1990. I first began taking uh, some of the Upledger uh, classes and uh, uh, served as a teaching assistant there for a while, did a lot of stuff uh, with them. Um, and concurrently with a French uh, osteopath named Alain Jahan, who had a very different style of uh, osteopathy. And he was actually coming here to Oregon uh, regularly to teach. Uh, and so I took his classes and developed a, a friendship that continues to this day with, uh, with Alain, very different style. And <clears throat> 
uh, got interested in osteopathy. The original osteopath was uh, Andrew Taylor Still, an American medical doctor, uh, born in 1831 in Virginia, although he lived most of his life in Kansas and Missouri territories. Uh, and so I read all of his published work and all the biographies I could get my hands on and a big swath of other uh, osteopathic uh, literature. Uh, then I took a, uh, a first visceral manipulation class with Jean -Pierre, French osteopath Jean-Pierre Barral's uh, team and was really quite taken uh, with that. So uh, I tr uh, trained extensively, including going to France to study with uh, Jean-Pierre and uh, trained to the instructor level in uh, visceral manipulation and also the then emerging classes that he began to offer in uh, nerve and vascular uh, manipulation. <clears throat> so I had these, these several different takes on osteopathy. Would you mind speaking to that a little bit? Because I feel like, you know, especially in the United States, it's not known, but because of the way you can be recognized or legal here, I don't, I don't feel like it's a, a common household name other than this umbrella of osteopath. But, you know, as you're just describing your journey and you kept on mentioning how they're, they're felt different or a different take, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Yes, I'd be, I'd be glad to. Uh, there are, okay, when, part of, let's go back a little bit into Andrew Taylor Still's history. Um, he, again, was a medical doctor. Uh, he had actually learned uh, by apprenticeship from his father, which was an ordinary process in those days. He would go on house calls with his father as a preschooler, so his medical education actually began before his elementary school uh, education did. Uh, he served as a, uh, uh, a surgeon with the Union Army in, in the uh, Civil War, and after the war became disaffected uh, with medicine as it was practiced in the mid-19th century. And it was easy to be disaffected with that. There were uh, lots of ways for that to improve. So he all but uh, quit practicing. Uh, he'd also had the experience early in life when his physician father had a job uh, then with the precursor organization of the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, on an Indian reservation in, uh, in Kansas. Uh, so... He also grew up speaking Shawnee and spending time with the uh, Shawnee healers, traditional healers uh, there. And so uh, after the war, he uh, wanted to find a different way and dived much deeper into anatomy, did more dissection, built upon philosophy that he had learned from the Shawnee and developed a manual therapy uh, system so that he was working with. There had been traditional manual therapists since time immemorial all over the world. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they're called uh, bone setters. In the Iberian Peninsula, they're called algebrista. Uh, in Mongolia, they're called uh, bariachi. Uh, and they're, they're everywhere and there are interesting broad similarities around the world and interesting local differences. So Andrew Taylor still became known as the lightning bone setter because he could get stuff done quick. Uh, he was very insightful. And wait, did Upledger learn from still? Do I remember the advice? He did not. He did not. No. Okay. Uh, no, uh, still died about 1915, and I don't remember. I think uh, Upledger was born around. I don't have the exact date in my head. Uh, about 15 years after, still had had died. So uh, people kept pestering still. Would you teach it, please? And his excuse always was, "I don't know how." And finally, when he was 66 years old, he opened a school in Kirksville, Missouri, which was immediately uh, very popular. And he intended that this be manual therapy only when he called it um, osteopathy. Um, 
osteo sounds like bone, and we're used to path as like pathology. But if you go back to the Greek roots of it, um, in Attic Greek, ancient Greek, osteon there is not bone, it's flesh in general. And pathos um, has the same meaning that it does in the theatrical world today, which is the deepest inner uh, feeling life of the person. So the job of the osteopath was to um, facilitate the, the inner and truest life of the person through the medium of the, of the flesh. And uh, so he taught the manual therapy, but under pressure from students and from state regulators, after just a few years, he was actually teaching uh, medicine. So in that era, osteopaths um, were learning his manual therapy and the medicine of the time. And there was sort of a golden age of osteopathy in this country, uh, kind of oh, 1920 to up to World War II, where osteopaths were, were well-versed in both. Um, along the way to this, there was an, an Englishman who came to study with him, John Martin Littlejohn, who he had an, it was an MD, had a doctorate in divinity and a third doctorate, and he came to still for treatment for a lung problem that he had, which worked really well. So he said, I want to learn your stuff. And so he still taught him, and as soon as he graduated, he was faculty, and he was there for a couple of years. Uh, while the school was still just manual therapy. And then uh, Little John had a falling out with Still. He went up to Chicago and opened the American School of Osteopathy, Medicine, and Surgery, teaching all of those things that Still later would, but which Still really didn't want at that time. And then after about 10 years, um, Little John said, no, I don't think so. And he closed up his school in uh, Chicago and he went back to his native uh, London and opened up the British School of Osteopathy, which continues there to this day uh, and was manual therapy only. So in the United States, the only place in the world, um, DO osteopath today has become essentially an alternative spelling of MD. And most osteopaths in this country don't actually practice manual therapy. Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually worked on a few uh, uh, oste American osteopaths who are um, generally amazing at spinal surgery, uh, but almost all of them, when I talk to them, they say they wish they had taken more of the manual manipulation stuff, but they were just, they didn't know it at the time. There was an episode in the 1970s when it was possible to get through some U.S. osteopathy schools without taking any manual therapy courses. That was actually true of John Upledger. He learned all of his manual therapy post-doc. Um, and so the British School of Osteopathy from Little John in the U.K. became the mother of all osteopathic schools in the world uh, outside of the U.S. Uh, we have the odd situation in Canada where there are now at least four European style uh, manual therapy only osteopathic schools there and U.S. trained osteopaths uh, practicing uh, medicine in, in Canada, uh, both of them using the same name but with very different practices. So that's one of the great divides in osteopathy is between where in the U.S. where it's essentially a another version of me, uh, medicine, medical practice and the rest of the world where it's manual therapy only. There are more divides. Um, one of them is in some quarters, osteopath, some osteopaths have gotten very interested in energetic phenomena and energetic ways of treating the body. And there are, I've heard some great rows between uh, osteopaths 
There are the ones who are very interested in structure in the body and manual therapy. And the energetic types think that those people who are actually touching the body and doing physical work are just incredibly crude dealing with this coarse matter. Whereas the ones who are putting their hands on doing structural work tend to think that the energetic ones are uh, airy fairy and out there and would they please touch the, the body. So those, those is the energetics, the more the biodynamics or is there, is it more beyond that? Uh, biodynamics is, is a, a prime example of that. Although even within biodynamics, uh, it's not unitary. There's more than one uh, school of, of uh, what biodynamics should, should look like. I had a friend who is a, I think he studied at the at BSO, the British school, and he got very into the history. And what he was saying was even in um, Andrew Taylor Still's book that he had stuff where he would have hands off and working with people hands off. I don't know the validity of that. I had to kind of trust him because he was an osteopath and I'm not, I don't know if you know much about that and if that's where some of the divide stuff came. Um, it is, you know, all of, I've read all of uh, Still's published uh, work. It's been a few years since I did it. And I don't remember his talking about working hands off. Um, one of the interesting things about Still is um, he, he taught philosophy of uh, healing and he taught anatomy. Uh, one of his expressions was in this school, we have three topics, anatomy and anatomy um, and anatomy. Uh, he himself was enormously creative in creating new technique. He was said to lie at wake at night, dreaming up new ways to do things. Uh, and he assumed that his students would exercise similar creativity. Uh, he wanted them to develop their own forms of, uh, of uh, manipulation. So there's actually a, a real he didn't write down in his several volumes of work how he did anything. He would talk about, yes, I worked on a frontal bone. Yes, I worked on a, a liver, but he wouldn't say anything about how he did it. Um, <clears throat> it wouldn't surprise me if there was some hands-off um, stuff mentioned in the books, but I don't immediately remember that. Well, it, it sounds like uh, Baral is a perfect student of, of A.T. Still of Still, because from what I gather about him, he, I've heard like he lays awake all night and he's constantly inventing new ways of, of working with and on people. Jean-Pierre is quite the innovator. Yes, he is. Uh, he's a very, he's an amazing clinician and uh, also an, an excellent teacher. So would you say Brawl's um, teachings is maybe holding the balance? We have taken a few of their classes and I mean, the placing the hand on top of the head and doing the assessment that way, I mean, that's kind of hands-on, kind of hands-off. Well, it's interesting the, how that has been taught, uh, general listening, that process is called. Yes. Uh, has been described in more than one way. In the early classes that I took, that was a very much a, a physical uh, process. You had somebody's body, um, you put a little more load on the top of it, and you look for where the body will crumple. And that uh, is, and there's a way of uh, confirming that. But uh, in Rolfer language, you're looking for a uh, place where there's a lack of lift uh, in, in the body. Uh, <clears throat> um, but there's more than one thing that he does on the top of the head. Uh, the, you're familiar, uh, you probably, do you have some familiarity with uh, applied kinesiology, asking questions of the, the body? Yeah. Uh, that's, it can be done anywhere. It's, somehow there's gotten to be a thing of doing it with the deltoid muscle although you can use any muscle for that. And one of the things that uh, Baral does on the top of the head, which, and I think 
is basically using the frontalis muscle where you don't push against it, but you observe its contraction. So if you see, you pose a question and you feel a forward pull on the top of the head, that's yes. And if there's a backward glide or no movement, that's no. So it's, it's something very physical that you feel. It's subtle. And if people looking from the outside don't know what you're doing, you might interpret it as energetic, but it's really pretty physical. Right. I remember in my in my trainings, granted, it's been a while, with the, the general listening, that there, yeah, that there was this balance of that you're actually feeling into something, but then it also felt a little kind of esoteric of like feeling into where, oh, I feel a block in this like far down in, you know, your right quadrant of your pelvis. Which I think the, when you talk about the, la the lack of lift in the Rolfing language, it, that can kind of, I yeah. see the comparison. Yeah, you can sort of feel down, in, if, feel down into the body. Um, but again, that's not, that's not really energetic. That's actually feeling into the body. And they, they sometimes try to teach doing that right out of the box. But that's actually uh, a more advanced technique. Uh, it's my opinion. It's it's better to start with looking for uh, where the physical bends are, which you see and feel. Um, there's another thing you can do anywhere on the body where you just put a hand on and you kind of sink through layers of tissue, feeling them at you, as you go. And you can feel, uh, if there's a distortion in there, you can feel a pull in some direction when you get to a particular layer. So the fancier version of general listening that you're describing is essentially doing layer listening from the top of the, the head. You're sort of marrying general listening and lower listening. So you're feeling down into the body to, to where something is. Jeff, to kind of get back about your history, one thing I noticed when I was I was in Vienna and wanted to see a rolfer, and I looked up on the on the the European rolf website, and a lot of rolfers what I found in Europe were osteopaths, and my guess is they found, they came to rolfing after osteopathy for sort of like the next sort of thing, but in the U.S. as we've kind of mentioned, there aren't many osteopaths, and to my knowledge. There's very few American osteopath rolfers, but were you one of the first ones or? Uh... Well, I, I am not an osteopath. I've done, done uh, intensive training with osteopaths. Okay. Uh, and do many osteopathically originated or derived uh, kind of things, but I, I do not have the credentials of an osteopath. Okay. My misunderstanding for some reason, I think just because you're so well-versed and you know a lot of that, I, I presumed, uh, I think Ron, Ron Murray is one, correct? Yes, Ron uh, Murray is, and uh, in Seattle, Alan Kaplan. Uh, they oh, both, Alan is. Yeah, they both uh, mm -hmm. studied at the uh, Canadian College of Osteopathy, uh, which was... Uh, the first of the several European style uh, osteopathic schools in Canada. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've shared this on the show before, before I did my rolfing, because I had studied body work before and I was making a choice between do I go to osteopathy or do I go to rolfing? Uh, and in the end, I decided rolfing mostly because I realized as an osteopath, I, I, I couldn't really market it in the U S <laughs> Uh, because people didn't really know what it was. And while I would get this great training, uh, I'd, be, I'd be somewhat limited in, in how I used it. Uh, so I, I went the rolfing way uh, and have no regrets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, again, Ida Rolf, since they got all of her ideas from, from osteopaths, uh, what she did, I mean, you know, her ideas are all part of the osteopathic canon. What she did was bring the relationship of the body to gravity, to the foreground, whereas that's a lesser and sometimes forgotten piece in osteopathy. So, and there's there's a big um, 
maybe a divide might be too dramatic, but, you know, sort of when you're, and we've talked about this with other people, but when you're working with people as a rofer, the techniques or the tactics, you know, is it fusing biodynamic cranial sacral therapy? Is that rolfing? If you're, you know, bringing those approaches, if you're using visceral manipulation, is that actually rolfing? What is, what's your sort of take on it? When I trained with Peter Melchior in 1977, he taught us repeated, emphasized, um, and embroidered with with teaching stories that there is no such thing as rolfing technique, that uh, anything you can do that will produce the changes that we associate uh, with rolfing uh, the, the classic hallmarks of good posture as uh, the easiest place for the body to be and the uh, integrated movement patterns in the body. Anything you can do that will achieve that uh, is rolfing. Um, there is a famous conversation <clears throat> that took place in Emmett Hutchins' house between he and Ida Rolf one evening, where after dinner, uh, Hutchins posed a question to Dr. Rolf and said, you know, if we were working with a client and uh, some things were coming along and we could see that there was a certain thing that wasn't uh, moving and wasn't quite right around the uh, hip joint and we could see that if we could free that uh, up, that a lot of things in the body would be better. And if we could accomplish that by um, saying a couple of magic words or, or whistling a popular tune, uh, would that be rolfing? And Ida's response was, what do you think? And uh, Hutchins uh, gulped and said, yeah, I, I, I think so. And Ida said, I think so too. So if it's legal to achieve the goals of rolfing by whistling a popular tune or um, making a magical incantation, that leaves a quite a wide field for what we can do to achieve things. Going back to my basic training, Melchior had trained with osteopaths and he would accomplish um, splendid things in working with his models with rather light touches in the body. We called him Peter the Feather. Uh, he was not in there with his knuckles and elbows in ways that have become associated with, with rolfing. So uh, I haven't done anything in my practice for a long time that I learned in a rolfing classroom because uh, I've learned uh, from osteopaths other ways of getting tissue to change that are uh, less effortful for me, highly successful in their, and more comfortable for the, the client. And I built on those by innovating several new ones of those. So uh, I never do anything in my practice anymore with knuckles and elbows and most of my body weight. Why would I want to work that hard? And yet everything I do is rolfing because it's uh, toward the goals of it. I loved how you shared that because I it's I still find it shocking and I mean I don't know why because it's it's what are you gonna talk what's more fun to talk about like the high heavy pressure and oh, I I really through rolfing and I could with the hold that pain but in Boulder I'm still surprised that rolfing still has this reputation of you know being so heavy-handed and high pressure considering there are so many rolfers in this town who do a, a variety of type of um modalities to in the name of structural integration to support the rolfing practice and coincidentally it's kind of been a common question that we talk about through our podcast because um it's always this question of how do you define rolfing is it really the touch and you know I'm, one of my first practices well my first practice was in aspen colorado and this was before instagram and social media where you did all your advertising i put an ad in the newspaper it said rolfing doesn't have to be painful 
had no idea that that would be my golden ticket to a full practice because I got so, I was just trying to be catchy and like, and yeah, to be like, it, it doesn't have to be painful. And, um, I got so many people being like, I've always, and still day, I mean, I still meet people in, in Boulder being like, I would love to get Rolf, but it's either, I don't want to feel the pain or I don't want to be crying on your table. I was like, wait a minute, there is so much more opportunities in this. <laughs> but I think I just really value how you said that because I, I, that I think that that really adds the finesse of what's possible in, in Rolfing. And it's not, and I've never felt even my, through my training that it was necessarily defined by the pressure. In my mind, I've always felt that it was you know, I always oriented my sessions around the principles that I was taught and how the sessions, you know, have these complementary principles that you add, you know, that you work with. So um, thank you for that. You're, you're welcome. And I like the way you, you talk about that. Uh, I'd like to bring in another piece here from my my experience that uh, takes this a, a, another another leg of the journey um, <clears throat> as I was studying with Baral and associates and learning as assessment methods um, well Baral said uh, always when you're working with somebody you need to find where you can work in each moment that's going to make the most positive change for the whole person and I remembered Melchior saying exactly the same thing. Um, you know, there have been various versions of the recipe out there, and the version that we got was uh, almost entirely uh, goals-oriented. First sessions, for example, well, let's do what's immediately available to improve the person's uh, breathing. Uh, and that might involve work around the thorax, but maybe not. Uh, several times in classroom demonstrations, Ida Rolf did a first session working on a person's feet and lower legs. And it wasn't that she had jumped ahead to a second hour. It's that the person's base of support was so rotten that there was no way they could relax into it from up above. So the best thing that could be done immediately for the person's breathing was to uh, give them a base of support that would allow them to relax down into it. Uh, and so again, again, sessions were described mostly by, by goals. Um, second sessions then had to do with, all right, let, let's build this person a better base of support. And sure, that would often involve work on feet, ankles, legs, but not necessarily, because it could be that there were big distortions higher in the body so that there's no way that the weight could fall uh, reasonably through the legs. So the way to get a better base of support might come from anywhere higher up in the body. And we were told, um, you know, if, if your sessions look like my demo sessions, you're in trouble because you're working on a different body out there. So again, this is his statement of at each moment, you must look at for where you what can where you can work in the person that's going to make the greatest change for the whole person, and then Baral uh, said the same thing, and he provided tools, the general listening and other assessment methods for figuring out uh, very physically where that sweet spot at that given moment is uh, in the body, but it sometimes happens that when two people use the same words, they don't actually mean quite the same thing by them. So uh, putting this to the test, um, I did an experiment of what will happen if I use Baral's assessment methods to guide my structural integration sessions, to what extent will the hallmarks of structural integration appear? And the answer was, oh, they appear very well uh, indeed, and in ways that are then uh, less effortful, because these sweet spots that you're looking for uh, happen to have one of their characteristics is you're working on things that are already in the process of change in the body. So you can assist the body in doing what it's trying to do and maybe give it some information about 
how it could do things even more uh, elegantly. And the body is quite willing to accept that. Whereas if you go for things that are not already changing, um, they're going to be harder to change and it may be easier for the body to put it back rather than have it spread out and affect a lot of, of other things in the body. So I had a good long experiment uh, with that uh, way of, of guiding what I do. And it is my considered opinion that um, teaching those assessment methods uh, to beginning rolfers would be an excellent thing to do. And that, uh, frankly, the recipe should be uh, well documented and find its future home in history books. Is that what you're, because I know one of the classes you teach is a uh, functional assessment. So I could have the name slightly wrong. And is that class more or less what you're talking about here? Yeah. So the class is uh, called Functional Methods, and it's a, a series of uh, four four day long uh, classes um, with some months in between to, to practice component skills from it. And in that, uh, I teach um, more than a dozen assessment methods and, and more than 20 different treatment methods uh, to, and there are some of those skills that assessment skills that one uses every day, but, uh, and there are others that are special situations come up and you need one. And also no one assessment method will show you everything. No one assessment method is perfect. They all have error rates. So if you come at things from more than one direction, you can uh, verify or disprove what the first one showed you and, and come to more truth with it. So yes, the functional methods class series teaches a collection of assessment methods and a collection of uh, osteopathic treatment methods. That sounds like a super fun class. What else are you teaching that we sh that um, our listeners should know about? Well, um, one that I've you you spoke of a little bit earlier that I've given a little gave a little introduction to through the Heller Work Association, and I'm giving a little bit bigger introduction to through the uh, Embodied Health Learning uh, Association at the moment has to do with joint capsules, bursas, and tendon sheaths. Um, I had some anatomical uh, insights about the glide planes between joint capsule and periosteum on the, the bone, uh, and in some cases between uh, joint capsule and um, articular cartilage, and the prevalence of adhesions in there, and some uh, detailed assessment methods for figuring out precisely uh, where those adhesions are and what their nature is, and then uh, bringing in treatment methods to, uh, to release those. Uh, then I realized that, oh, there are two other kinds of synovia in the body, that bursas have walls that are essentially the same thing as joint capsules, exactly the same fluid inside, but these do not have structure related to bone. They're little flat uh, sacs of uh, gel-filled uh, tissue that lie between things that as we move, we don't want them rubbing against each other in the body. So there are little buffers in there. But the poor bursas are in high stress areas in the body. They easily get inflamed. Uh, bursitis is very popular. Uh, and then as the um, fibroblasts are trying to repair the damage, all too often, instead of just growing new fiber for the walls of the bursa, Fiber grows across the hollow space of the versa to the other side, so now they don't roll anymore. So instead of facilitating uh, movement in the body, they're now uh, limiting movement in the body. So again, I've developed uh, assessment methods for figuring out exactly uh, uh, where those problems are and releasing that. And then uh, tendons in our bodies have each of them has one of two very different kinds of environment that it's in. All um, tendons have at least part of their length that is in loose areolar tissue, which is quite stretchy 
and allows the tish, uh, tendons to move past adjacent tissues by virtue of the stretch in that loose areolar tissue. But some tendons have part of their length which is inside a tube of material that's the same thing as a joint capsule or a bursa wall and filled with the same synovial fluid so there's even better glide in there and you can get uh, adhesions within those tenosynovia as they're, they're called or fibrosity of the uh, blues areolar tissue and the other portions of that so the uh, joint bursa and tendon classes provide detailed assessment methods to figure out exactly where the fibrosities are in those uh, synovial tissues and then treatment methods for, for freeing those. Also sounds like a super fun class. And just for the listeners, this is all virtual. So this is something that people can, it's not in person. So another way of learning without well, having to be in person at the time, right? Am well, I wrong? At the moment, um, again, I taught a, a, a single two-hour introduction to the joint person attending classes through the Hello Work Association. And just actually yesterday, did the first of a six-part series on the joint person attending work, six one-hour pieces for embodied health uh, learning. The first one's recorded for people who want to jump in uh, there. Uh, the full uh, joint bursa tendon in-person class series, when we get back to those, um, is a series of uh, four classes, four days in the first class, three days for each of the others. Um, so a total of uh, 13 days of uh, instruction uh, for that. I also teach uh, visceral manipulation. I mentioned that I trained at the instructor level with uh, Baral. I don't have an association with the Baral Institute at this time. I have a good friendship with Jean-Pierre Baral, but I'm not teaching for his institute. But I have his uh, permission and uh, encouragement to uh, teach visceral manipulation uh, independently. And so I have a series of uh, five four-day uh, classes in which we make a comprehensive tour of all of the uh, internal organs, all of their natural attachments and uh, their glide planes with uh, adjacent uh, structures. Sounds awesome. I mean, everything that you, you do generally sounds awesome, but you know, now we sound a little bit like fanboys and, and ladies. I guess I'll sort of say one issue with you, Jeff, is that you just know so much that we could talk for another hour or two, uh, but do need to be mindful of your time, uh, our time, and also more importantly, the people's listening time. And so possibly if we're lucky in the future, we'd have you on for some more talk. Cause I also, there's a lot of the history stuff. I, I feel that you have so much knowledge on that I'd love to share with more people, um, but you know, everything in its right place. Before we, we sort of say our goodbyes, is there anything that you haven't said that you, you really would like to share? Um, I remember when I was considering becoming a, a rolfer, uh, this was at the juncture at, at which I had just graduated from uh, college. I had my shiny new degree in biology and I was back working with my old summer job for the U.S. Forest Service again and it just wasn't as much fun as it used to be. And uh, so I looked around for what I, will I really do in life and I looked at a lot of different things. And one of the things that uh, I settled, what I said along was Rolfing, and there were several things that I liked about that. I got to uh, help people, got to work for myself, which I liked, but also I recognized that there would be no end of interesting things to learn. And 44 years later, uh, it's so, there's no end in, in sight. And we're also grateful for your curiosity and able to craft it in a way that is um, learnable. There's lots of people who I feel have great insight, are really great at what they do, but just don't have the, the teaching gene. And I feel like, you know, what I've, what I've seen of yours, and I would love to take an in-person class at some point in a COVID free, less frisky world, but I certainly loved and have gotten so much of what's out there on, on the, the interwebs that you've been so generous with. 
So thank you. Thanks, Nikki. That means it means a lot to me. Uh, you're right about the genes. I had two very dedicated school teacher parents, uh, and uh, um, I've you know I've been a, a chronic student in my my life, and uh, along the way, I've tried to pay attention as other people were teaching to what worked well and what didn't. Because one of the things that you can continue to grow with also is craft as a teacher. And it, it means a lot to me to to teach well. Actually, I have to um, say that a significant part of my persona as a teacher is modeled on my fifth grade teacher, Geraldine Dawson, who won awards quite rightfully for her teaching. And it was just a fantastic teacher. Uh, great. So, Jeff, how do people what's the best way for people to find you if they do want to learn more about you, uh, study more with you, all that stuff? I do have a, a web, website, it's jeffreybirch.com. If you visit that uh, today, you'll see a banner up in the front of it uh, saying that it's uh, uh, receiving maintenance. The banner has been there for a little while and will likely persist for a bit because there are lots of changes afoot. There were some changes that needed to be made even before COVID time and COVID has thrown um, uh, some curves, so I'm not quite sure what some things are going to look like. So you won't get a lot of information there today. But as part of the that banner, uh, there's also my email address on it. So shoot me an email and we'll talk. And later, the uh, website, which is actually quite information rich with lots of articles and links will be available again. Super, super. And I think it's great that a Rolfers website is in maintenance because that's just uh, aligned with, with us. We're always in maintenance and we're always doing maintenance with people. <laughs> <laughs> well, super, super, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I know it's getting late out there. We really appreciate it. I hope we didn't cut into your dinner time too much. And um, oh, we, we enjoyed, enjoyed dinner before this. Yeah. So, yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Nikki. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank it's been a pleasure, you. Jeff. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to us at Touching Into Presence. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find out more about Jeffrey at jeffreybirch.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast and subscribe to it through the platform of your choice. When you do this, it really helps other people find us, and we greatly appreciate your support. We look forward to hearing back from you and seeing you on our next conversation at Touching Into Presence. Bye-bye.